This episode of the Better Two podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of the Better Two Burnout series, which includes her latest releases of Fairy Tales and I Love You and His Love Just Another High. Hi, gang. Welcome to the Better Two podcast with DM Needham. I'm your host, DM Needham, or Donna, as most people know me as. I am in the process because, you you know, usually I talk about what's going on in my life and I am in the process of moving. So this episode was taped a little while ago, but I wanted to make sure that you guys got an episode out. I didn't want to take a long swath of a break, but if there's a little bit of break after this episode, it's because I'm in the process of moving and hopefully it'll be a short break and not a long break. Today's guest is JV Hillard and his name is Joe he goes by but we discussed that right off the bat of why he chose to go by JV Hillard as far as his pen name he is the author of the War Mister series but it's not just a book series and in fact by the time this interview airs all of his books will be out so you should check it out because it sounds like he takes a lot of time and a lot of pride creating this world and making it something interesting and something that is larger than life so not only though is this a series it also is in the process of being made into an ar vr game so a virtual reality game where you can step into his book series and be the characters but as we discussed in the podcast there may be some changes to that also he's in the process the storyboarding process of turning this into a graphic novel so maybe one day we might actually even see a movie from it we have an interesting conversation about writing and about just being an author and all the challenges in of creating a world and making it something that you guys like a lot so tune in hi gang donna from the better two podcast here if you've listened to my show you know that it always sounds great that's thanks to the guys at third year audio productions Third Ear Audio helps podcasters, broadcasters, musicians, and business owners get their important messages out to their audience. Rich and the Third Ear Audio team are easy to work with. They're efficient in understanding that your message is important to you. With quick turnaround and a true caring of your needs, Third Ear Audio is your go-to for any audio message. Reach out to Third Ear Audio at 312-388-5596. Rich and his team will deliver for you. That's 312-388-5596, or you can email them at info at thirdyearaudio.com, or visit them on the web at www.thirdyearaudio.com. Hi, Joe. How are you doing today? I'm very well. Thanks for asking, and thanks for having me on. You're, you're welcome. We just had a conversation off screen, and, and for you guys who follow Joe in the writing realm, he is actually J.V. Hillard, and we had a conversation about why you became J.V., and so that sounds like we might as well just go right there. Yeah. So, you know, it's a it's an abbreviation of my first and middle initial. And frankly, in the fantasy adventure realm, many authors like me have this. So J.K. Rowling's or George R. R. Martin or or J. R. R. Tolkien or R. A. Salvatore. It's kind of a thing. I don't know how it became a thing, but it became a thing. And my publisher said, you know. It's it would differentiate me because Joe's a really common name, right? And so, you know, for me that breaks away. And there's there we looked and there were no other JVs in my space, so we thought JV would be the way to go. So, just took the first couple of initials and just made it a thing. Then of course there are the JV sports teams, but you know that's <laughs> oh, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> but we know that different your books... realm. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> and, and from what I read in your bio, it doesn't look like your books are of the JV realm as far as you know, you're putting yourself out there, you've gotten, this isn't just a book. This is a book that's going to be turned into a game and possibly a graphic novel. So these books are not just, I mean, if I were going to say JV, you have one book to your name and that's it, but no, you have three out now, correct? Because you released the last one. I do one. with a, yeah, with a fourth on the way, we, uh, it's an editing right now and the fourth will wind up the Warminster Saga, which is a four book series that um, as you mentioned, it's going to be turned into an augmented reality and virtual reality video game in 2024, end of 2024, beginning of 2025. Uh, and then the graphic novel, uh, which is we're working on that right now, uh, should come out in mid to late 2025 when all is said and done. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the saga has had its success. And you know, now I'm licensing that intellectual property over to 
different forms of media and in the hopes of continuing its popularity there. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, it's, it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. It was unexpected in many respects, but, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad we had a chance to talk a little bit about that today. And I'll, I'll tell you something else about the bio too. The bio I put together for those of you who haven't read the bio in either the book or on my website, um, I cast myself as a character inside, uh, the realm of Warminster. So I'm really the chronicler uh, of it all. And it, it's, it's, uh, it, I was asked to do that in the strangest way, instead of having the bio that talks about my wife and, you know, the family and where I went to school, I just coded everything. And if you could decode it, you could figure out who I am, where I went to school, you know, what, you know, what's going on, what my wife is, is all about and what the family's all about and my two dogs and all that kind of fun stuff. So it. I, I did it because a, a different interviewer had asked, he said, look, I, I'm, I get a lot of people that want to be on the show. If you want to impress me, do something that's different. And so I put some time into that. And I submitted it and he didn't have me on the show. He wrote me back and said, what is this? I don't understand what this is. You're not being serious. I thought you wanted to be on the show. And I said, you told me to be creative. So how else can I be more creative than, than literally, you know, casting myself as one of my characters? And he never responded to me. So, but I tell you, everybody that sees it, they don't forget it. And, you know, for me, it's a nice little entree into conversations like this. So uh, if you're into decoding and you want to find out that I actually live in Pittsburgh and, you know, where I went to school, you can just, just look for the, the, the signs cast in, in the form of me as the chronicler of the realm of Warminster and you'll, you'll figure it out. Well, see, and this is the thing, when you, you give a, you tell a writer, be creative. What do you think they're going to do? You're going to think Especially they're going to write that writes fantasy. Yeah. I mean, you think they're going to write, hi, my name is Joe. And I yeah. live in, I mean, that's not creative. That's, that's not the, anything that's going to knock your socks off. That's just kind of, te- that's just kind of normal information. It, it's, I, I've had this conversation a couple of times with people because when I was in college, I went back the second time to college and I was 27 years old. So I had life experience. And so I'm in a room with all these other younger people than me, you know, 19 year olds, 18, 19 year olds. And our writing teacher gave us an assignment to write our eulogy. Mm. Very much like you, I took myself and placed myself in my story and wrote this nice eulogy with my characters grieving and i mean i I painted a whole scene so it really wasn't a it wasn't really a eulogy per se i mean you you got the eulogy but you got all the emotion of the characters and the setting and everything else so my teacher starts handing papers back most of the kids wrote an obituary they didn't get the 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 eulogy versus yeah Yeah. so then (laughs) so then she comes to me at the very thing the very last and she goes okay you want to know what a eulogy is? Read this. And so a couple of people did. And I made them cry. And I was just like, okay, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. But yeah, you stick yourself <laughs> in the story. It's like, all right, I can do this. This, is, this yeah. will be fun for me. I don't want to write about death, but you want me to write my eulogy? Okay. Yeah. I'll do it this way. Uh, yeah. To pivot back, since you were saying you were licensing this. Yeah. So are you expecting to try to land a movie deal as well? Uh, whew. I, I don't know. I mean, it would be great. I mean, I think in some respects, that's sort of the brass ring, right? I think everybody, that's the holy grail of what we do. Many movies have been made out of many books. It usually works that way. It, you know, work, books in, in particular in today's marketplace uh, for movies or Netflix deals, they want you, you know, they want to see that you've got a half a million followers and you're on the right kind of bestseller lists and that, it, you know, it, it ameliorates the risk for them, I think. Uh, in many respects. And so I'm building toward that. It, it would be fantastic. I think that, you know, the kind of books I write, like many authors in my genre, would require a bit a big budget in, in the terms of the fact that we've got, you know, uh, CGI and all the other kind of things that come with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, I, you know, my guess is that I'd have to do a little bit better in terms of followers and readership than I currently have. But I think that translating what I've written into a different medium, or in this case, media will allow me to do that. I mean, there's a, a certain parallel and a sidecar to those that read my stuff and also that read comics or graphic novels. And there's a, a certain sidecar to the, those that read my stuff and also play video games that are fantasy or adventure or RPG games there's a nice hand and glove fit. And I think that's an easy attraction for both of those. And I think, you know, if you bolt them onto the current readership, I hope that I can get there one day. And I think it would be a lot of fun. I, I just, I'm, you know, 
you take it one step at a time. And I, you know, at first, you know, I never thought I'd hear someone say, "Hey, you want to make this into a video game?" And bang, you know, it's it's there. And and then the graphic novel thing, I always thought was a chance, you know, just based on the kind of stuff I write. And uh, you know, thankfully, it's it's worked out that we're heading in that direction. It's in the very very early stages, but you know, I've got the first like dozen pages that are black and white, no text, uh, no color, you know, that kind of stuff, just to kind of get a sense of what it is, almost storyboarding it, mm-hmm. which is a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And storyboarding the video game was even more ridiculous, you know, because you're you're literally working with coders that are trying to get into your head that want to know where the storyline, but then they're telling you, eh, that doesn't really work well for a video game. So we're going to go in this direction. Are you okay with that? You know, and you're like, mm, it's kind of my baby. Uh, I get it. You know, because some of the characters in the video game, you mm-hmm. might choose to do something different than the characters in the book did. And, you know, the characters in the book have been memorialized and what they their decisions are you as a player and an avatar in the game could do different things and so uh you have to be accepting of that and kind of step back and and let them do what they do best in their realm and i do what i do best in mine so it's it's been exciting and different and nothing i ever expected to be doing (laughs) that that, that's one of the hardest things as you said you know the book your book is your baby and it is and and I think this is where, you know, let's, let's go back to the infancy of writing as far as being an author. That first time you write something, you're very protective of it. And you're very, at least I was, I would share, I would write with people as write fan fiction. But as I progress as a writer, it's like, you're hesitant to give it, you have to, there has to be a comfort and a trust level with the person you let read it at first because this is your baby, this is your heart, and you have to develop a thick skin. Because that, you, that go ahead. No, I was gonna say, you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, that's exactly what I did. I took it to a uh, friend of mine who was a, uh, an associate professor at a community college who had written a memoir and was an author herself and someone that I trusted I'd known for you know, a dozen, maybe 15 years at the time. And I asked her for a professional opinion. I was like, is this something that's publishable or am I barking up the wrong tree? And, you know, ulti- I know I made the bad pun. I'm sorry, I had to do it. I've got two of them here. It's I don't know what anyway. he's doing. He never does this. <laughs> it's all right, it's okay. Um, but, the, uh, but the concept is, you know, like I, I, exactly what you said. I, I took it to someone that I trusted because uh, you're vulnerable at that point and you don't know what they're going to say. But her honesty really helped and I did develop that thick skin and I ended up taking a writing class and I learned how to write prose and I learned how to write dialogue for the first time and I learned how to pace things the right way as opposed to just, you know, dumping information into into novels and showing and not telling it and things that I didn't know that I needed to do because for the 20 years of my career, I was writing nonfiction, you know, and so for me, even though I wrote every day, it was not writing fantasy adventure so that was a little bit different and so that class and then creating a group of beta readers around me that helped um you know with that as well as putting it in front of someone who trust that i trusted their opinion on she came back and said this is publishable but this is what i would change and if you listen to that and don't take it to heart and be shy about it and really kind of go back and, and tweak it um which i did it, it ended up getting published right and and that's the kind of thing Uh, that I think all authors want to see. They want to see their stuff be successful, whether they're an indie author or someone that's traditionally published or somewhere in the middle. uh, You you just want to make sure that what you're doing, people are enjoying, they're entertaining themselves, but you ultimately want it to be the best product it can be before it hits the marketplace. Exactly, exactly. When I took a creative writing class, I had had a teacher who had been, she had published several fiction books, been on a bestseller list and everything else. First thing out of her mouth when she sits down with us is, None of you, none of you should use um, multiple POVs in a book. And I'm (laughs) sitting there and I have a book that I've been working on for 20 something years at this point that has dual POVs. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I wait till after class and I go up to her. I'm like, can I give you something to read? And she's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. So I gave her my thing to read. And after the next time she saw me, which was about a week later, she's like, all right, what I said does not apply to you. I'm like, okay, okay. Because yeah. immediately it was just like, oh, what have I done? Because that's that's what I had been writing. It was something I was comfortable with. So I think, you know, if you can take a writing class, even if it's just information, it gets you a little bit more comfortable reading and sharing with other people. Because in those kind of creative set- settings, even if it's a workshop, you have to share your work. 
And yes, there is the issue of maybe somebody might take my idea. That might be true, but let's be honest here. We're not recreating the wheel in our stories. Everything that we've ever written, somebody else has written something similar. It's just our voice may be a little different. That's exactly right. You know, and, and I have a similar story. You know, I was speaking at a um, community college once uh, and the, the speaker right in front of me told he was giving a similar speech and his was the do's and don'ts of writing. He's like, never write a book, you know, and never start a book in a dream sequence. And I got up right after him and I said, my book starts in a dream sequence, <laughs> but you know, it's an Amazon bestseller and, but it's important to the, the, the main character as a prophet. And he has a, uh, you know, a, a power that he sees things while he dreams. Others look into mirrors or crystal balls or flames or, you know, bones or, you know, they entrails in his case, his, you know, power comes to him in the form of, of dreams. So it was important to start in a dream. And there was a lot of symbolism in that dream uh, as part of that. And, and we kind of joked about it afterward, but you're right. And and for my genre, fantasy, almost all books have multi-point of view characters in it. I mean, it's just something that's, right. that is traditionally done. It's accepted by the readership of that. Now I can understand maybe not all, um, you know, romance novels for one, or, uh, you know, I've seen multi points of views in romance novels. I've seen multi points of views in places, you know, it, I, you know, I just hate the, the strict, you can't do this. And then someone else does it. And you're like, well, they did it. You know, I have a friend that's a writer that writes, he wants to write like James Patterson and he's quick, but he has a hundred chapters in his book and they're all two or three pages long. My chapters are 8,000 words long, 5,000 words long. They're just, it's just, different and if things flow and you like reading what you're reading it doesn't matter you know and you know those things i think might be general rules of thumb but at the end of the day you know if you've got a good product people are going to read it and they're going to accept the way it's written might be different and or there there may be varying opinions on how things get done but you know hard fast rules in my opinion rarely if ever work well the first book i the second book i released um, and she might have been saying it because it was first person I was writing in, but I wrote a duet with first person and it is a, it's a ro romantic suspense book. So yeah. I, my, my very first book, I can't really categorize because this dude is a rock star, male rock star <laughs> who is just out of his mind. He is out of his mind. And you go on this wild ride with him that has a twist ending. But the whole fact is I was going to kill him off and in, in, and I know your characters must come to you as well. He comes to me, he's like, uh -uh, no, 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 don't kill me off. Don't kill me off. I got a better idea for you. So he did. But the see, the interesting thing is, as you were saying about rules, my series does not follow any rules. And when you said about the whole dream thing, my second, my second book in the series opens up with the woman having a dream about said yeah. dude. So, you know. Yeah, I know. That's what I mean. Like, and it's not like it hasn't been done. And I get it. There are certain things that might be that you want to stay away from uh, and things like that. But if you're doing it the right way and you're presenting it in a way perhaps no one's ever seen before. Uh, and in my case, I'm sure people have seen this kind of thing. Uh, but ultimately, it's really it's central to the character. It's, it's his power. This his mm -hmm. literally the, the ancients, which are my term for the gods of my realm, the pantheon of gods of my realm, the ancients have bestowed this power upon them. So it's important that you're kind of punched in the face with it right out of the gate. And you're presented with, you know, the enemy at the same time. Like he's having these dreams about walking into this dense fog and he comes across a placid lake and this man floats across. And it's the, it gets into the whole like chosen one forgotten prophet trope or, or for false prophet trope that's there. And, you know, you get it right away. You're like, you're in, you have now been pulled into this from minute one in the book and even though it's i think um maybe it's a no-no for most of the time in my case it's so central to the character it's hard to pull it away from it you know i well and see here's the thing in in my story in the first book the guy has a dream about her and basically ah. in the open and the, basically in the opening of the other book she's having the same dream see oh i like that that's so interesting that's, see, that's, that, what... that's unique though like you don't see that a lot right so i i think you can get away with that uh mm -hmm. without uh you know violating these rules of principles that certain people for whatever <laughs> reason put up the those barriers and you then know kind of this... lock themselves in then i take this whole thing where because i know that first book is triggering for some people and it's really hard to read 
So I wrote the second book in her point of view and you can read it without reading his book. But then I wrote the third book from the whole series with her, the whole book with her, with his point of view. So it, it's not a normal series. And it's like, well, that's the way it's going to be. So you got to do you. And that's what you're doing. You're doing you. I'm doing me. And I think as authors, whatever works to get the reader out there. And if they're enjoying it, that's what matters. It shouldn't be. Yeah. We don't all exactly learn right. the same. We don't all write the same. Our voices aren't the same. So yeah. why put ourselves in a box? I 100% I, I agree. I have a friend of mine who wrote a four book series and each of the characters are main characters in one of the four books and you can pick them up at any any point and read them through you know so it's it's not choose your own adventure ish but it's almost like i'm going to read this book from this character's point of view and then i'm going to read that one from the other character's point of view and you're going to see all their points of view from point of view and then non-point of view characters in all four books and by the time you read them even though to some degree it's it's cyclical you've read different stories and it's just a super cool creative thing. And, but if you took that to somebody, they might say, Oh, what are you doing? That's, you know, why would you do that? And, you know, the path of least resistance and, you know, I call BS on that stuff. Well, that, <laughs> just do it. Do what makes sense for your well, story. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so it's the rock star genre. That's basically how I will, will say what I write. But the fact is there's a, I wrote a vampire short story back in 2010. I got award an award but i've always wanted to expand it so what i did was the one of the characters in the book she's in the movie for that so that when i expand that will become part of the series it'll be a standalone book but it's still attached well you had me at vampire uh i read everything voraciously that have vampires in it i've even gone and snuck into some movies that might be a little teeny bopper-ish because I like vampires and I'm not going to say what movies they are, but I'm sure you can guess what they were. Uh, Do they based sparkle? On... Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. I'm on, they can see me. They know who I am right now, but uh, you know, or Buffy, you know, you, even the, yeah. the campy stuff. I just love this. I and mean, I've always wanted to write a vampire novel. And one of those no-nos that you're told about is that, well, if they, if you're known in this genre, you, if you're Stephen King, you can't write a romance, right? Because people are going to think it's a, it's a thriller or it's a horror or it's a, or it's a suspense book. And it's like, Oh, I have to create a whole new, and, and, but I one day are going to, I'm so jealous of you. I want to, I have this great vampire story, but I'm afraid to do it until I'm ready to do it. And, you know, and so I'm getting it. Like I already, it's already in my head. I know what's going to happen. But you've already beaten me to your punch. You've got your vampire novel. And it sounds like it's going to be a series. So good well, good for you. It's going to be attached to the Rockstar series. But here's the, the thing about it is, you know, when you're talking about vampires, I liked Buff the I like the movie Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love that movie. I never really watched the series. But yes, I watched the originals. And yes, I watched Vampire Diaries. And I got to, you know, I did go to the I did go to the vampire convention as well. Oh, which, good for you. But I only went there to give Joseph Morgan a book because Klaus kind of had that rock star swagger that I wanted to give my character. So when I was watching, it was like, okay, yeah, that's that. So I did that. But I mean, I think for us, it's like, Charlie, <laughs> I think for us- He just wants to chat, that's all. That's I know good. he's never like this though. Um, I think it's, it's important that, you know, when we're talking, you're saying you can't switch. That's what people say. But if you look at Anne Rice, Speaking of vampires, if you look at Anne yeah. Rice, she had the whole Sleeping Beauty series. And yes, they flowered it and said it was Anne Rampling. But the yeah. fact of the matter is everybody knows it's Anne Rice. Yeah, no, it's dumb that way. I mean, they, I, I don't get why they have to try to hide behind it. I Look, I, I know that expect, but if people realize that you're writing in a different genre, that doesn't mean you're going to be less any good of an author, mm -mm. right? It just means that you're trying your hand at something else. And I applaud that. Like, I, I think that that's... That's great, and there are people out there. You could, I could name fifteen authors that you that you're surprised what they wrote. You know, and some of them are like, oh, they went from speculative poetry to nonfiction. Like, how did that happen? You know, or how did they go from nonfiction to speculative poetry? But it it happens, and it's okay. And I and I think that those false rules that people set up, you know, if you're creative, you're there's no rules. It's all made up in your head anyway. So like, <laughs> do, do what you want to do. Right? As as Outback would say, no rules, just right. <laughs> I mean, exactly. when, when I did the vampire thing, I went, tr I tried to be different about it. So I made my vampire dominatrix. That's cool. Because I'm like, what way 
a lot of those people that might seek that person out, she, she would investigate them, make sure they had no family. If they had no family, when she was done toying with them, she could kill them. Yeah, that's right. And it's over. You don't have to worry about it. No. So Yeah. No, it's, I like that. It's almost like the reverse Dexter. You know what I mean? Where it's like, yeah. I'm going to investigate this person and then, you know, I got to go kill them because they're bad people. But I'm I'm exercising my serial killer demons out on the right people that everyone wants me to get rid of. You know, in this case, she's just taking it out on victims that there's no one going to care because there's no one there. You, you, so. saw, you sought her out. So, you know. Yeah, you asked for it. <laughs> Here's the ultimate punishment. Yeah. <laughs> so, I well mean, that, said. that's well the thing. Said. I think as creatives, we get characters that pop on our head for no apparent reason and you have to run with them you have to build on them even if it's going to break somebody's rules i mean let's the movie the name of the movie that won't be mentioned about vampires i mean that broke a major rule because oh. of the sparkly but well, 10 different uh, rules right yeah like, yeah literally they're walking around during the sun or they're they're you know you've got i mean let's not we you're right uh you know but uh, you know ultimately that's okay i mean mm -hmm. that's creative license to do what you want to do and you want to have something that's unique to your world and so you know what the twilight novels did and there i did it see so we can get <gasps> out of the way and we don't have to worry about it anymore <laughs> what the twilight novels did and then the hence the movies i mean they had vampires that were pregnant they had vampires that each of them had their own separate abilities yeah. some more powerful than the others and you know, and this idea that they had territory and the, and basically you had vegan vampires. Like in this case, it was like, hey, I'm not going to eat human blood, but I'll go kill a deer. And it's like, wait, what are we talking about here? Like, what is going on? You know, like I'm going to eat like like Louis from Anne Rice, you mentioned yeah. before, yeah. is eating on rats because he doesn't want to kill people in the beginning. And then he just finally breaks down and says, I'm, I'm a vampire eventually. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of stuff, you know, I think is is cool. And it's almost it, it, it. There's a humanistic element to that that gets built into those kind of novels where it's like it's slow. It's not like you've lost your humanity right away. You're trying to retain what's already lost. You don't realize that you changed, or you don't realize that you're dead in some respects. And meanwhile, it's like, hey, you know, you you're going to eventually fall to this because you're no longer what you were, and you've morphed into this. And you know, the sparkly vampire thing was, you know, that's a little. I mean, I guess that's a teeny bopper teenage girl thing you know as a, as opposed to you know true blood which was more like like Anne rice meets a i don't know what that was it was like <laughs> i don't know if she wrote that with like hot flashes or whatever but that was there was some strange sexual connotations with that stuff um and i think the hbo i think it was hbo adaptation yeah. of that really took advantage of that because again we hadn't seen that and then you have this artificial blood and we're gonna control them and vampires are gonna come out from this secret society and you know all that stuff and you look at underworld or other things that are like that and you just everyone has their own specific I angle know. on it it doesn't have to be the bella lugosi gothic even though that's my favorite you know it, it could be something more contemporary that that folks are going to want to read and you can target different genres and ya even uh in many respects to you know let's face it every girl i know is either team edward or team jacob right that's just the way it is and in certain age groups you are what you are right and it's like yeah. my wife was team jacob and didn't even didn't care she doesn't didn't like edward you know but then there are girls out there that like the british guy the skinny british guy that's pale and sparkles in the sun i, I don't know it's not not my well, bag so well, <laughs> i mean to be to be fair to be fair there so i there i wrote two vampire short stories and one was about a girl who basically was ill and she was going to kill herself meets a vampire and changes her life and only to decide that she really doesn't like this but her when she sees her sister for the first time after she's transformed her sister's like i know what you are and her, she's like what she goes i read twilight i know what you are do you sparkle uh -huh. in the day i wrote it in 2010 that was the height of it and then yes it dates the book but twilight and them i, I mean i hate to say it still stands people still know it oh sure yeah, and look, popularity like and that there goes to prove that you could take something and and change it dramatically. Like some people might say it's watered down. I don't think it's watered down. It's just a different kind of it's a different world, right? What she created was a different world and you cast yourself in that and you live within that realm. So there's shapeshifters there and they hide in societies. There are vampires there and they hide in societies and this is how they survive in many respects but also how they hunt and she just created her own thing. And it's like, well, dude, this isn't what, give me a break. It's, it's okay. It's fiction. We're all having fun writing our stuff. And if you like it, go buy it. But right? then and the, that's it. 
the interesting thing though, when you think about this, so, cause we, we, we go from twilight because we all know that 50 shades was twilight fan fiction. Mm-hmm. How did you get, well, yeah. there's your dominatrix for you, right? Yeah, it's just the opposite yeah. side of it, right? Yeah. Instead of being the submissive, yeah. you know. And in the case of of uh, Fifty Shades, uh, again, that was it was. I want to say groundbreaking is not the right word, but it's something that it that's hard envelope. to right. It's exactly right. You're basically taking a concept that's been, you know, Marquis de Sade behind the doors, and no one wants to talk about it, and it's sort of taboo. And then mainstreaming it and it's showing that this can happen and they fall in love and how it changes both the characters in the novels uh, for better or worse. And whether or not you like it, like the, the books or if you like the movies, you didn't like them. It doesn't matter. They were extremely popular because they gave people something to think about and they pushed the envelope, uh, like you said, and, and it got people, you know, open minded uh, to certain things and a level of from the point of view of a woman uh, instead of it being the point of view of a of a guy in that situation and you know a submissive versus someone who's dominant in that situation and here you are flipping the script you've got a dominatrix vampire uh on your side that's taking advantage of people and it's like it and i think that kind of stuff showing it from the opposite side sometimes people are myopic and they don't do that and this allows folks to to kind of jump into that and really kind of see something. And I think that's why it's so popular. That's why Twilight or, or Hunger Games. I mean, it, at the base, Hunger Games is a dystopian novel about kids that kill themselves, mm-hmm. right? Literally, you, we're going to write a book about eight, less than 18-year-olds that are going to fight to the death. And no one talks about that. You know, or we see movies like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Guess what? Buffy the Vampire Buffy's a, she's a cheerleader, Mm -hmm. you know, and again, underage and there's sex scenes and stuff like that. And it's okay to do it, you know, for Friday the 13th where all the, you know, the kids are, or scream where all the kids are in high school and they're having sex and all this stuff and showing this, these sins and they get killed in these movies. So all you're doing is just amplifying it a bit and changing the lighting and showing it from a different perspective. And, you know, and that's why I think things like 50 shades and or twilight are, are super popular and people just gravitate to them. I, I have to ask this because, you know, yes, I wrote from a guy's point of view and I, I've been told by men that I handled that very well, but I've noticed that for you, you get away, you can get away with stuff a little bit because you're writing fantasy, but is it harder? Because some of the times that I've read guys writing women, it's been really, really bad. Some of the ones that I've seen online, do you find it harder to write in the, in the perspective of a woman? Or have you written uh, as a, in the perspective of a woman? So one of my main characters in the Warminster saga is Princess Adeline Elspeth. And she's one of three main characters. The other two are male. She's female. Uh, and I don't find problems with it. Uh, I, I also am blessed with the fact that my two beta reader groups are 100% made up of women. So the minute that I get called on it, it changes, right? Because they're like, well, that's not what I would think. I, and I'll give you a perfect example of one. I, I literally gave something to, it was a scene um, where, and, and this wasn't in, this was a short story I was doing on Vela. Uh, I, I gave to the, the, the group a scene where this girl is rescued from the sea and um, is taken to this parsonage and the parson and his wife care for her to bring her back to, but not back to life, but basically heal her from this poison and this, you know, she was mm-hmm. in the sea or whatever. And he doesn't know what to do with the, with the baby. And, you know, I wrote it in a way where it was like, Oh, let's, you know, we'll give the baby away. And the, everybody in my class was like, no, that woman is going to take care of that baby. And she's going to love that baby. And I was like, okay, change it, you know, but that's yeah. the value of having a constructive critical critiquing group who will tell you the things that you're missing because i do that for them like they give me stuff all the time about what what do guys think about this you know what do you what you know what am i writing this okay from a guy's point of view and most of the time it's pretty tap dead center other times they're off and they're like guys i would never say that like or a guy would never do that or you know and when i say that i mean not universally but you know where i'm going with that Mm -hmm. the majority of men would not act that way or would not think that way and so i'm there i'm their sounding board for them too and I like the idea that my beta readers, none of them read fiction or uh, fantasy often, 
you know, and so I'm reading one of the, the, the women in my group is a doctor who writes fantasy and erotica. The other has, is a memoirist who's also writing uh, young adult stuff. And the third woman writes horror. Uh, and so none of us write what anybody else writes. So when we're reading it, there's this visceral reaction sometimes where it's like, I don't understand where this is going or mm-hmm. why did you say this this way? And like the, the, the romance stuff is really what gets me. It's like, I, I sometimes, um, you know, I'll stumble through it cause I'm, I don't read it, you know? And I'm like, well, man, that guy would never like, why would the guy say, you know, or what is the guy thinking? And most of the time she's right on target. And so you, you, I compliment her. I'm like, Oh, wow. You really got this down from a, from a male point of view and some, and I would suggest that, of her two main characters in a multi point of view story that's in romance. Uh, I like, I believe that her male character is be- more believable to me than the female character. Not that it, hers isn't, but the character she she's written is one that as a guy, it's like, yeah, no, there were some times where there was like a babysitter thing going on and the guy's a doctor and I'm like, no, you know, we got to, I know this might be going down the path you want it to go, but it's not going down the path. You, it, it would it, no, a doctor would never put themselves in that situation, like that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But you know, ultimately, you know, it's interesting for me to read what other people put to, and I think that iron sharpens iron, right? And mm-hmm. it's good to get those because I, you want other writers and those that read your genre well to critique it to say you're really off or this is 10 years outdated like people don't talk this way anymore in our novels or there are concepts like we you know we've got you know all sorts of lgbtq stuff and there it's almost like you have to have them in your novels or else you know and that wasn't the case even 10 years ago right Mm -hmm. and so you know there are things that we need to consider now and and those that read it often are able to translate it and you might not see it because you're so close to your work. You're, you're nose blind to it. And they're there to pick that out for you. One of the harder things for me in writing that I have to deal with is I have to go back because I write in the eighties. I write mainly, my story starts off in the eighties, sometimes goes into the nineties, but you have a different realm of, I mean, I hate to say it's like fantasy because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. So there's a whole different thing. And I remember one of my editors, she's like, cause I listed that this was a novel that's set in the 90s and I had somebody driving a Volkswagen Cabriolet convertible. And she's like, well, why couldn't you just put Volkswagen convertible? And I'm like, because there's seven different kinds. Yeah. And I, I want, you know, if I'm going to write, if I'm going to write in that time thing, I in that time frame, I have to make sure that there's nods to this. That way, somebody maybe who had a Volkswagen Cabriolet is like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that car. That was my best, you know. So I, I tried for me, I tried to make that realism hit those points. And for fantasy, you have to do the same thing. You have to create this world that is so believable that when somebody steps into it, they feel it. Yeah, you know, I, and for us, it's even deeper. Like you can get away with exactly what you said. It could just be a car. So if, if I said that Joe got in his car and drove down the street, I you already know what happened. But if I say that in my realm, it doesn't make sense. I have to just tell you whether the sky is blue or not, or is there mm-hmm. gravity in my sci-fi book? Or, mm-hmm. you know, you know, do we have cars? Or are you still using horse and buggy? And what kind of horses? And what kind of buggy? And you know, what kind of weapons do you have? And there's anachronistic language you use, you know, to make it feel like a Tolkien kind of novel, but is it a Tolkien kind of novel? You know, you can make up whatever. It doesn't have to be you, you borrowing from the Renaissance era or the medieval eras of Northern Europe. It can be whatever you want it to be. So for us, you know, it takes a lot more world building around that uh, to make that true. And you get a lot of that in urban fantasy. You get a lot of that in magical realism where there's, you know, you're basically in contemporary times, but there's one thing like Buffy, you know, hey, there, we're, we're, you know, it's 1985, but there's vampires, right? right, you right. Know, or, you know, like that kind of stuff for the, you know, Twilight, hey, it's, it's 2000 and we're in Seattle where it's really cool and rains a lot and there's vampires and werewolves, right? And, but everything else is, is normal. So there's just a touch of fantasy that gets written into it or a touch of sci-fi that gets written into those novels. Uh, and so you can get away with just describing, I was in a beat up, pinto right, right and it's right. like it doesn't matter what year it was or right what is everyone can picture the car that you're in uh where you know for me it's a lot you've got to go much deeper and you can't like you religious systems government systems you know ethos uh you know currency uh things like that you have to create and people like you said you have to do it just far enough that they can dis- dis- suspend disbelief and say yeah i can see this happening 
and then immerse themselves in it. And and that's when I think that transition and that escapism happens where they get entertained. It's like, okay, this realm is it's clear. There's magic. What does that mean? Oh, I get it. I see how it works now. And there are rules around it. Uh, and it makes it that much more believable in a fantastical story. One of the things, um, it's, it's kind of funny because when you think about it, I was recently, because I'm getting ready to teach a class about coming from going from a writer to being an author at the library. And so I was doing some research, digging into things and the movie Wonder Boys came to mind. And the reason why, the reason why I kind of smiled when you were talking about creating the government system and everything else is there's a scene in Wonder Boys where um, she's telling him, she's telling Michael Douglas, you did not, you know, maybe you overwrote just a little bit because we didn't need to know about the the mayor's lineage we didn't need to know about the horse's lineage you know and their their history and this and this and this so it's like there's times as an author because yeah okay i'll be really bad here yes it's a book on new york city from 1985 <laughs> uh because i i want i want to go for I, that restaurant may not exist anymore if i go look for it online it may not exist so right. for me i'm doing those little tidbits but i don't have to go as deep as you but i still have to it, it that's the fine line about it being an author because when you look at ann rice ann rice was so detailed in her description it was lovely some of her descriptions were so lovely but i remember reading interview i loved interview it was great i think by the time i got to the third book it was so detailed that i was just kind of like i i it it wore me down i wasn't as Ooh, engaged that's a real good point so there's a fine line between being too descriptive and authors i mean I, and everyone falls into this at some point readers are smart they're going to figure it out you got to give them just enough that they're building the world in their own head i i and, and I think the thing that firmed it up for me is there's an author in my genre named R.A. Salvatore. And Bob Salvatore, you know, wrote this story about this magical, well, lots of magic in it. Obviously, it was a Dungeons and Dragons -ish kind of novel. And one of the beasts, the the uh, companion, the beast companion of this main character is uh, a, a very difficultly spelled name that looks like Guinevar. So when I wrote it, in my head, I was pronouncing it Guinevar. You're at a con, you know, a, a con with him, and you someone says, I'm pronouncing this game of R. Is that the way it should be pronounced? And his answer was, it's pronounced however you want to pronounce it. Right. And that's the thing where you walk just up just enough detail where it's like you drop something and you don't have to explain it. It's just there for detail and it makes it more real. But you can't tell uh, you, you have to show me. You can't mm -hmm. tell me if you're just telling me that the grand castle sat on the hill don't, don't put me in the castle tell me is it cold you know what i mean tell me what the walls look like are they you know are they clean or are they you know are they dripping with 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 moss and and uh, ivy and things like that and, and that I, okay i get it you don't have to go anymore and i'll build the castle in my head so you have to walk that fine line and doing it the right way giving enough to mm -hmm. put it over the top but also not too much that you got Anne Rice like you did, where it's it's great to have the description, but it's almost like, is it too much? And it's like, all right, let's get through it. I, I can figure this out on my own. There, there's a description. And since we're talking, you know, I, I do stick sometimes into the romance area. When I wrote uh, my second book, I gave it to this group. They all loved the book, but they had one problem. I didn't describe him enough. I didn't describe his girth or his size. And I'm just like, you can't put this to your imagination yeah just make it whatever no, you, they appeals want to it. you so the next time i'm like all right there's a song by vanity and she says i need seven inches or more i'm like okay i got this one i'll handle this just beautifully i have the guy walk <laughs> up behind the girl and he's like yeah i got eight <laughs> yeah and then you, you slipped it in and you and you you showed and didn't tell right, right. Exactly. it's just like i i don't understand what i'm not gonna why do you need it described? I mean, he's going to be the lover. If you want him to be a stallion, then let him be a stallion. If you want him not to be that great, if he's giving her the big O, why do you need to know the size? That's right. Yeah, it, I. Not that I've ever written anything that graphic, but mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, it's the same thing. You want to, you want people when you, they look at your characters to formulate what they look like mm -hmm. on their own. Like I can describe that that Adeline is a vermilion elf and the name vermilion comes from the color vermilion. So her hair is crimson red, her eyes are crimson red. 
alabaster skin. In your head, you've already created her. Like, right. I don't have to say that she has a thin nose and highbrow, right. you know, cheeks and all that other kind of stuff. And she's six foot tall. I describe them in weird ways where he's, you know, he's uh, taller than the, he's, you know, twice the size of an average right. man, meaning he's a big barbarian guy. You know, and you, you in your head, I didn't tell you he was six foot eight. I just told yeah. you that he was bigger than the average bear, right? And that's all right. you need to do uh, to do that. And I think that you... You know, you can get away with it. And, and I think that's when people lose. And I hear this all the time. Like, how many times have you gone into a movie after reading the book and the movie doesn't ever leave up to the book? It's because the book is perfectly in your mind. The mm -hmm. characters you've created, you've read in the book and you've formulated them. And so perfect example, Lee Child, Jack Reacher, six foot ten. Right. Who do they pick as the uh, as the actor? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, <laughs> five foot six. Like, and you can't watch that movie without saying this isn't Jack Reacher. And what? then you see the the uh, the the new Reacher, and the guy that got and you're like, that's Reacher. <laughs> like, it's it is it's, you know it's Interview with a Vampire. Tom yeah. Cruise once again. It you know you pick him and it's like I did he he did an okay job. Okay, I'll give him that. But yeah. honestly, it was like no. This is not, no, no. Yeah, this is not Lestat. No. Now, the new guy. <laughs> to his credit, he did a good yeah. job as Lestat. Yeah, he did. I won't. He did. I, I, it would not have been my choice, but he did a good job with he, it. There's some movies he's done very, very well, and it's just, yeah, it wasn't my choice. But, you know, <laughs> him in Rock of Ages playing the coked out dude was pretty darn funny, but, you know. It was. It was good. It was um, good. Yeah. Now, you write your genre, I write my genre, but there's one genre that, neither one of us right but it was pretty popular for a bit i don't know that it's still popular but it was flying off the shelves sometime about mm, four years ago and that was dinosaur porn or dinosaur yeah. excuse me let me rephrase dinosaur erotica and i'm like <laughs> why i so let me let me i'm just gonna be honest i've been doing this now for about three years mm -hmm. i have never had a conversation with anybody about dinosaur erotica i didn't even know it existed until this very moment in time uh now it's different that you mention it because there is that furry kind of thing that's been going on yeah, in, in yeah. the last decade or so that's become a little bit more more mainstream <laughs> it's close it's it, it's furry adjacent put it that way i don't know what that means but that's what i'm going to characterize it as i thought you were going to go like steampunk or you or you're no, cyberpunk and you're no. like dinosaur erotica i was like yeah hey, that's a new one that's a new yes, one i gotta add that, that to the list the, i was i was just like and, and i <laughs> i've never bought the book i've read the preview and i mean it was like i think it was like 25 pages long or maybe 30 or 50 tops and it was like 2.99 and i'm like but it was like massively downloaded and i sat down with a writer friend and read the preview and we had a laugh because it's like who thinks of this yeah that's the thing like sometimes it's just that it doesn't have to be good it just has to be something so different that it's that like the train wreck you try to look away from but you can't look away from it right exactly You're like I, why why did you just download this and you know when the fbi come and grab your computer they're gonna be like what the hell but i'm a writer yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was research. I swear it was research. <laughs> that well, and that's the thing. Let's be honest here. I mean, for you, you're dealing with fantasy. For me, some of the stuff I've had to research, I'm like, man, oh man, if anybody ever looks at my search history, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I've had that you mentioned before about you know, realism and people calling you on things. Like the thing that I had to research was how a privy in a castle worked. You know, because there's a scene in one of my novels where someone is murdered and stuffed into basically a large toilet that goes from the top of the castle down to the bottom. I didn't know how that works. So I literally had to research that. And in order to do that, you there, you can try Googling that. You're like, you know, basically crappers in a, in a castle, how do they work? <laughs> comma. Right. And then that's the thing. It's like, well, there's this shaft and it would go down into typically it would drop right into the bottom of a, of a river or an underground stream. And then they would go in there and they'd send some poor guy in to clean it every now and then. You know, and so it was actually simpler than I thought. It was basically just, a, you know, a one stack the hole that went three floors down. And it's very similar to what we have in our houses, except we have plumbing. They didn't. They just had a hole and they went in the hole and sat on a piece of wood. So it was like an outhouse inside, mm -hmm. you know, and try to explain that to someone if they ever looked at your search uh, or, you know, what do falcons eat? Like I have a, my, one of my characters has a you know, a war falcon that flies from his arm and he uses for hunting and stuff like that. And I was like, well, how does he reward it? And I was like, 
I, I don't know. What do they eat? Well, I know they eat other birds. And you're like, all right, well, what does that mean? And so you had to look and what they do, falconry, they give them pieces of like basically beef jerky and they eat them to reward them. And that's weird stuff that you're Googling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, looking up the looking up dominatrix stuff, looking up uh <laughs> because my rock star is the drug addict looking up all the stuff and that's the funny thing when you think about the the main rule of writing uh write what you know okay well let's be honest here i kind of lived the 80s so i understand that but a fantasy you have not lived that you know so how, that that whole rule the once again we're talking about rules you know it, it's it's something that doesn't necessarily work if you're writing fantasy or you know true fiction you haven't experienced everything you're ever going to write about so i i kind of because i was taking acting classes in college and my acting coach said something that was very important to me which was live in the moment so when you're writing you have to live in that moment even if it's fantasy because when you're writing i'm sure you believe in that thing that you're writing about so you're living yeah, you and creating to. that moment. Yeah. Yeah, you are, especially when you, so when you're writing epic fantasy, like I do, I mean, an epic fantasy, for those who don't know the difference between like a classical fantasy novel or sword and sorcery and epic fantasy, you know, sword and sorcery is like Conan the Barbarian, where it's basically a, a medieval society of some kind. And then there's this magic in the background and it's, it's, it's odd and it's sudden and it's rare. And then, you know, classical, like high, high fantasy is more like Dungeons and Dragons, where it's episodic and, you know, there's a beginning and an end. Epic fantasy is Tolkienish. It's, you know, there's a history that you need to learn as a reader and you have to immerse yourself in that history to understand the present and where it's going in the future. So there's a future past present. You've got to build the world around that. It's not something that's episodic. So for me, you know, some of that is in building it. And all of a sudden you've created these rules for the society so there's some warm Mysterian rules and the pantheon of gods and the the mint where they create their gold coins but you can't call them gold coins because that's two dungeons and dragons is so they're golden palmettes or silver laurels or copper sheaves and you make up your own money system uh to to you know to fit into it and or what are some of the norms that can happen in those societies what's uh, the mores that that could happen like what do people believe in and what do they allow what's acceptable for them and you know is gambling okay is it puritan you know like a puritan society or is it not and what are their pockets of different beliefs and where they are in the realm and you you, you make all that up and now all of a sudden i've made a realm that doesn't exist with a lot of rules that i have to follow as an author but to write it well you have to know those rules and you have to know the rules through the eyes of the character through which you're writing so they might be different for damis who spends his life in a cathedral learning to use his powers of of prophecy than ritter who is you know an action-oriented long marcher whose job it is to patrol the borderlands and keep the bad monsters away from his people you know they just have two different sets of they, and it would be true and so they look at things differently and so you know i think those things become more believable when you follow your own rules and you set them and you show them in action uh, as you write them so you can even though no matter how tangential it is as long as you're able to show mm -hmm. that people will get that and say okay well that's how they play ball here and so i get it when in rome i'm going to do as ritter does or when in rome i'm going to do as damis does and that's how it kind of fits in i have an interesting question but i, I kind of would have to i have to ask this one question first so did you watch caprica no Okay. What Caprica, is Caprica? Caprica was a side series to Battlestar Galactica. Oh, okay. And I'm familiar with Battlestar, yeah. Right. So it was on very limited. I think it was on sci fi for maybe like 10 episodes, if that. But the reason why I asked is because they they basically got into we're in the decline of the society in part at certain areas again, and then we have the upper echelon. But there's a lot of people that are hooked on augmented reality. This is like a dope, they're like using it as a drug. So that's why I was gonna ask about how do you feel about the, I mean, I know it's a great thing that you're doing the augmented reality game. I understand that that's great, but do you see any downside to it? Or do you have, are you a player yourself or how do you feel about it? Uh, I'm a player myself and there are nuances here. Uh, and I think that there is a, a great series uh, written by Klein uh, that is Ready Player One and Ready Player Two uh, that talks about a dystopian futuristic society in 2040 
where that's exactly what happens. Like everybody, no one goes outside because of the pollution and the starvation and all the problems. So people live their lives in the oasis, which is a society that's been created online through virtual reality. And so they put on their goggles and they create their own avatars and they live in that society. Now there's a lot of social commentary that Klein uses in those novels, but at the end of the day, it's really a fun story about a kid who worships the guy that created the Oasis. And when this guy dies, this guy's favorite time were the 1980s and early 1990s. And so he's created this adventure to turn over the Oasis to the person that could figure out his game, right? Nice. And that's really what it's about. And so you fall in love with the novels and or the movie because you're chasing these things that are kind of, you know, from 2040, someone's playing a Breakfast Club movie or The Shining and things like that. And you're like, what is this? what's going on? But you know, you you look at it from the person who made the Oasis. That was their that was their favorite time. So they're hearkening back to that, and they're using this virtual reality to relive their glory days or relive their past or correct their mistakes. And a lot of those things are baked into this stuff. And, and a lot of folks too look at it and say, well, I can be whoever I want to be. I'm born this, but mm -hmm. I don't want to look like this. You know what I mean? I want to be something else. And in virtual reality, you can do that. You you can absolutely step in and create your own name. You can create your own look. You can earn your own stuff, uh, and that's that is a lot different. And you've seen that even in some philosophy classes where people have philosophized about the Matrix. Like if you could plug yourself into the Matrix and live your perfect life and die, not knowing that you were ever out, would you do it? Or would, if right. you knew that you were in there, would you still do it? Because you're living this you know utopian life until the end but you're not really living it. It's all pre-programmed uh, versus do you live your own life, which could lead to a variety of bad things, but at least you lived your own life. And there are questions like that. And so for me, you know, I'm a gamer. I have no problems with it. And we're not going to be around when those things no. you know, really get to that point. But ultimately you're right. I mean, the, the value of the, the game is there, you know, I think it's just, you're playing something that's a fantasy and it's just like playing, I liken it to, I'm a, I'm a and d guy. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons my entire life. And so, you know, I'm role playing there, even though I might not do it. You know, I got a piece of paper that tells me what my character can do. It's not a lot different. And it's all in my head. It's a group delusion among those who are playing the game, as opposed to me putting on a headset and actually seeing it and it coming to life for me. And so, yes, there's a lot of bad things to it, but, you know, I don't know a single technology that was meant for good that's ever not been used for bad. So I'm sure some things will go off the rails one day. But for me, it's just a source of entertainment for people. Well, I mean, they get to it, live in the realm of Warminster. It's the same thing, though, with writing. I mean, you're living in that world when you're writing. You're de you're dealing mm -hmm. with that. And as far as like the, the video game thing back to that, Wally is the same thing. Wally's the kid's version of Ready Player One because yeah. everybody's laying around on the couch watching TV. We're not doing anything. We're all. And, and unfortunately, as AI grows, we may end up to that point because AI does a lot. And you've seen those commentaries in Star Trek and the Picard series. You've seen it in um, different avenues of media, how a bit Terminator or games. I mean, we got the negative out there too, but we also have the societal issues of, well, now we everything's automated. So you don't have to go do that job anymore. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, you mentioned Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek, mm -hmm. 30 years ago with next generation had the mm -hmm. holodeck yep. right there that's the ultimate virtual reality where it's programmable it has ai in it and it was an escape for them and, it, and there was one episode maybe a couple where it went off the rails you know and that was something they commented on but for the most part it was escapism like i live on the ship mm -hmm. i can't be out in the middle of nowhere so i have to create this technology that allows me to pretend that I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I'm on a I'm on a dude ranch or I'm at this bar that I like to go to and I'm going to see people and 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 talk to folks and those kind of things I think um you know in all honesty you know they Star Trek probably did it the best and the cleanest you know where the ready player one stuff or um sounds like to me like Caprica that was also like a social indictment yeah. about it's going to this thing's going to oh, punch yeah. you in the face so have a little fun but well, it's, and see, it's not real. <laughs> and, and that was the start of the Cylons too. Caprica was, you're going to see how a Cylon gets built. Yeah, this is how the Cylons come about. But I did virtual reality um, 
in New Orleans, they had it at Jack's Brewery where this was like 1995. So you had to go and, and sign up and pay $20 to stand in a circle with the big heavy headset and the line drawn dinosaur or whatever you were you were dealing with. So mm -hmm. I mean, I've done that before and I play video games, not very often, but I play video games. So you the escapism we all need it and i'm not i'm not sitting there saying a bad commentary it's just it's intriguing to see how social commentary sometimes paints everything very dark and then paints everything very light and when you think about the hunger games movie shortly after the hunger Games movies came out everybody i i told my husband this at the time i'm like isn't it funny that the Hunger Games came out and we're talking, we're selling you dystopia. We are selling you a dystopian fantasy. And now Taco Bell, McDonald's, everybody has painted their places gray. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, we, I, it was just something to me. It was like, so are we trying to set us up for this dystopia? I mean, because everything's going to be gray now. Why? Yeah, I don't know. Like, and, and, you know, <clears throat> life in the tapes, art limitates life, right? So I mm -hmm. think that sometimes, you know, there are, things that get really popular for a while and there's the copycat stuff too and that you got know, that's dangerous in our realm where you always want to be unique as a writer and write something and not follow in the footsteps but you know ultimately hunger games isn't that much different than 1984 you yeah. know what i mean it was it had a little different story but not much of one when you dig into it there's districts and there's here's the coal miners and here's this place where everybody has everything and the haves have and the have nots nice. have nothing and then you can fight together and the, the concept behind the hunger games was we're going to give your district just enough food if you win right and mm -hmm. like that kind of stuff and it'll make it better for you for just a little bit and that's why they would fight in these games and they would pick their kids and then we you know we we read about that a lot in Eric Maria Remark stuff when you go back to the, you know, you know, uh, all quiet on the Western Front, you know, with all these 17, 18 year old, even 16 year old German kids that mm -hmm. were slaughtered because no, you know, an adult's not dumb enough to put himself in the way of a bullet. These kids can be brainwashed into this ideological thing they don't know anything about and told to go fight at the front until they get there and the bullets start to fly. And then think bad things happen. And that's the same thing the Hunger Games is really hearkening on too. And you know, Katniss is a perfect example of that. I mean, she's she doesn't want to go. She's reluctant to go, but she she steps up to take the place of her sister who would have been killed, you know, and then she doesn't want to kill people in the game. So she tries not to kill people. Um, and that just doesn't work. And eventually she becomes a killer. And it's how that society has bent her to doing those things and uh you know it's just real interesting commentary that's buried in those but you're right you know life imitates art imitates life mm -hmm. so is there anything that we didn't really talk about that you want to mention no you know I, the only thing i would appreciate i mean a little plug if you guys are interested in what you've heard and you enjoy reading epic or dark fantasy check me out at jvhilliard.com or you, any of my socials are at, at jvhilliardbooks uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, Discord, uh, YouTube. You'll find me there. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for having me on the show. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and chat with your viewers and, and get a chance to chat with you. This really interesting conversation. I can now chalk up that I talked about dinosaur erotica, and I never thought that those words would ever come out of my mouth in, the, in, that, in that framework. But, hey, we're there. And it's 2024. I'm not going to complain. I mean, you know, you do you. <laughs> it's it's writer to writer, and I, you know, when you when you're looking at things that sell, you just kind of go, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, how did it, why did I miss that? I missed the dinosaur erotica train. I couldn't see I you writing that, but <laughs> anyway, thanks for coming on. It has been my absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. So as we wrapped it up, you you obviously saw us laughing about the dinosaur porn. Because, you know, if you look it up, and I'm not trying to restart that anything, it was rather amusing to read because you, you, you just can't think about a T-Rex and a person. But, you know, somebody did. Somebody took the effort there and did that. And, you know, if it's not your thing, which it wasn't mine, um, you just kind of have to laugh because what made you think that it was a good idea? I guess fantasy is everything and not knocking it if you like it love it it's it's your thing and you know not everybody not everything i write is everybody's cup of tea and same thing with jv but it's always interesting to see what's out there in the realm of writing so i think if you're a writer and you were checking this podcast out you know break the rules yes you you know we are taught that you better have these rules in place 
But quite honestly, as we talked about also, our story that we're writing, some of those elements in that story have been told before. And it's the only reason it's different is because it's our voice. It's our character that we've given it a different, different spin. So if you're a writer, don't sit there and be fearful that, oh my gosh, I can't break that rule. I can't make that change. Be, be true to who you are. Be true to your creativity. Be true to your power and your passion and believe in yourself. Have the faith that you can do this and step out of your comfort zone. And I know that's way easier said than done. It's like both of him and I said, you know, you have to come from, and it's very hard as a writer, you have to come from that place of trust. And so you may give a book to your, you know, you may give your writing to a friend to check out, but there still has to be that level of comfort. I once had a roommate and she was my best friend, but I still never trusted her enough to provide her with anything I wrote because I didn't trust her enough that she would be honest or she would be cruel just to be cruel. And I didn't need that. So be careful when you hand out your writing that you can trust the person and that they're not telling you things because they're jealous, envious, or they're just being cruel. Because sometimes even our best friends, at least in my experience, are not always the best person. So, and I, you know, you, this is a lesson you learn as a younger person, but that's a whole other podcast that maybe I'll do one day, but it's a lesson you learn. You learn who you can trust. And that is a major thing. And it comes that way when you do your writing, whether it's music, any kind of creative passion before you share it with somebody, you have to have a level of trust and putting it out there for the world to see comes with a lot of strength and a lot of trust that you have to have compassion for yourself and you have to be honest with yourself to know that this is ready to see the world is ready to see this <clears throat> excuse me so on that note as always i you know now as i'm sure you've noticed besides youtube you can also see the video on spotify so now we have two avenues where you can watch the video of the podcast and it's on all the channels if you found it here wherever you're listening, if you found it on Apple iTunes or whatever, you or I, the podcast, you can actually go see the video on Spotify or YouTube. So we're trying to branch that out. As always, Rich Zai from Third Year Audio Productions does the sound and both of our intro music is done by Fast Susie. So check them out when you get a chance. Anyway, I would like to thank you guys for tuning in as always, whether it be day, night, evening, weekend, whenever, I thank you and appreciate you for tuning in. And if you ever want to be a guest on the podcast or want to drop me a line um, or just say hi to show, you know, to let me know you're listening, please do so. It would be great to hear some feedback. Anyway, I hope you have a great day, evening, weekend, whenever you're listening, and I'll catch you next time, guys. Bye. Bye.